His educational path is filled with rigorous and extensive preparation to assume his role as a spiritual leader in our community. He is also a licensed physician certified by the boards of internal medicine and served as a professor of medicine at Georgetown University. His touch points with federal service are unique and quite remarkable as he served as a medical eth uh, ethicist on the Defense Health Board in 2008-2009, advising our United States Secretary of Defense on research and policy matters. Father Blazik has already been a frequent guest speaker uh, on radio broadcasts like Morning Air and a recurring contributor to publications like Newsweek and the Washington Post. Now here, that's not even the, the most interesting thing about Father Blazik for us as a Golden Eagle Battalion. What's even more astounding for us is that Father Blasek is also a product of Marquette University. Marquette University Army ROTC, class of 1986. He's a distinguished military graduate from our program. He was trained as an infantryman and served in the story 101st Airborne Air Assault Division as a platoon leader and logistics officer. A veteran of both Desert Shield, Desert Storm, a man who has earned his Combat Infantryman Badge, Bronze Star Medal, several Commendation Medals, Achievement Medals. And with that, what I will offer to you is introducing Father William Blasick, sir. Thank you for coming and speaking with us. Well, thanks so much, sir. General Dean Holtz, good to have you here with us. A lot of distinguished retired colonels, other leaders to the family and friends. So uh, I actually was lost that morning at the RNTC Division of Company, so for all my uh, accomplishments. I can't tell you, you know, what a pleasure it is to be here. And it strikes me that we really have with us uh, the future, the present, and the past to celebrate on, on Memorial Day, right? We have these cadets who will take the contract, so we're looking at the future course going to lead great <coughs> men and women in our armed forces, uh, in the Army particularly. We have a few visitors here from the Navy showing the flag, and it's good to have them here with us. And then we have the present in the cadre, right, the cadre and the, the, the officers and NCOs who train these great cadets. And then uh, we're celebrating and honoring the past. These are veterans who have served. So I, I just want to touch on a few themes for us this morning. Service promises, the oath, right, values, and fellowship. So veterans have served. Veterans have taken an oath and lived it up, we hope, right? Veterans have values. They have those great army values, those military values. And veterans enjoy a special fellowship, right? There is a companionship, a fellowship of serving in the profession of arms. So thanks be to God for it. On that theme of service, uh, I took the occasion to interview a few cadets and a few veterans about why they had put on the uniform. And almost universally, to serve, the words to serve, topped the list among their deep desires, their deepest desires of their hearts. And we have with us here retired Colonel Ed Manning, also a product of this ROTC detachment. And uh, one time commander, we talked about Ranger Challenge, but Colonel Manning was the leader when I joined of what was at that time called the Light Team, the Light Infantry Tactical Element. And we did tactics up at uh, Fort McCoy, but it's also a lighthearted allusion in the name to the product of a certain company. I'm not allowed to give brand endorsements here, but the company <laughs> might brew something in a valley not particularly hard from here. It might involve hops, something like Milwaukee tradition. So when I asked Colonel Manning, he said, I wanted to give back to my country for all the opportunities America provided to me and my family. I wanted to give back to my country for all the opportunities America provided to me and my family. I wanted to serve my country. Well, that it seems pretty straightforward. Veterans are patriots, right? Serving the greater good, the nation, a people. I asked a cadet who had passed through here, Cadet 
Caroline Mitchell, who's also a, a daughter of a, a new ROTC alum. She started in, in ROTC. She's actually at the military academy now. And she said, I want to serve because I think it allows me to work towards something greater than myself. Something greater than myself. Now, Marquette Catholic University, Jesuit University, that's a very Catholic value. We call it serving the common good. Serving the common good. Not just our own interests, not just the interests of our families, but those of our neighbors. Our neighbors, be they nearby and well known, or more anonymous, you know, more abstract, maybe even our crazy neighbors from California, or <coughs> further out than someplace like that. Or we serve really global stability. That's pretty abstract, but the service of our armed forces provides stability in Africa, in Central America, in South America. That is the common good, and it is a selfless kind of service. Sometimes people want to know, you know, how is it that, that I ended up in ROTC? So I'll share with you that uh, our year group, we, we were joined in 82, and I was living in the dorm in McCormick Hall. At that time, it was the largest all-men's dormitory in North America, they say. And um, it was the Reagan years, Reagan Revolution. We were looking for a way to be of service. My dad had served. We met a guy, John Crenson served, was in ROTC. And a couple of us just said, well, why don't we join up? So we went down to the detachment, and actually, who did we find but then Captain Gessner, who we said, hey, we want to join up. And you know, I'm a knucklehead, I'm 18 years old. I figure they got my hands shaking a little bit. I figure, it's going to sign right here. We got a sweet gig in Hawaii, we're going to send you off, you know, you'll be there soon. And uh, I never did get that assignment. <laughs> but actually, what Captain Gessner said was one of the smartest things I think of it. He said, have you talked to your parents about this yet? And uh, that's a great kind of counsel we got from the country, because why would I talk to my parents? You know, it's just my entire future. They raised me, they were sending me to Marquette. So that was sort of just the entry day and how that happened that way. And then great things went on to follow. I just want to tie that idea of military service to a Jesuit theme, Marquette's a Jesuit University. And it was founded, this university, by religious priests dedicated to a way of life of another former soldier, St. Ignatius of Loyola. St. Ignatius of Loyola had a spiritual enlightenment after having been seriously wounded at the Battle of Pamplona in the 16th century. He was hit in the leg by a cannonball. Praying afterwards is what led him ultimately to found the Society of Jesus. So it struck me this morning that if it had existed, you know, at the time, St. Ignatius in a certain level was actually a Purple Heart veteran, right? He was a wounded veteran of the military. In the first vows, as a Jesuit, we take vows, and we vow poverty, chastity, and obedience, right? So simplicity, right? Chastity is chastity. Obedience, we follow our orders, right? We, we do what we are told. So on some levels, it actually sounds like ROTC, you know, or like being deployed on, on a certain level. But our vow formula stipulates, Lord, we know we are unworthy, but we have a deep desire to serve. We know we are unworthy, but we have a deep desire to serve. So there's a certain humility. It's a, a humility we look for in the Jesuits, but as a humility, I think we hope to find in our military leaders, those who take serious positions of leadership over the young people, different American citizens from all over the country that they will lead. Yes, we have a certain amount of pride and confidence and bravado in the military, particularly as a leader. You need that sometimes. But I think all leaders here, anybody who's really carried that responsibility, recognize that it's those we serve with, those we lead, who in many times are much more worthy than ourselves. And that revelation might come in seeing how they conduct their family lives. You know, they might have a spouse with cancer. One of your soldiers might have that, or one of your colleagues. Uh, how they handle a challenging mission, right? Wet, cold, tired. You still get the smile. Somebody still offers you a cup of coffee that they took the time to make. Or how somebody might counsel a subordinate or a buddy facing a really tight spot professionally. You know, maybe they've been pressured to change some numbers on a report 
or something. And these are just kind of the rubber meets the road places where your subordinates, your colleagues, your buddies will really impress us. And I think they push us to the limits of our performance and they really cause us as leaders to want to excel, to want to be better for them. What about the oath, right? Veterans are promise keepers on a certain level. And those in uniforms make a public declaration, a profession, they speak it. And these, you know, classically law, clergy, medicine, and the military. Professions, we're told, require specialized knowledge, use of weapons, map reading that they're learning, how to use military communication equipment, but more so here, leadership, management, strategic planning, or operational planning. Professions have a governing body, National Command Authority, right? Uh, convention of Ethics, that Army ethos. And then, professions are more a vocation than an occupation. It's not something one just does for money. You can't do it just for the scholarship. Scholarship's great, it's a wonderful package. But, I was talking with Johnny Manny and son, he said, they, these cadets, Caroline uh, Mitchell recognizes, you have to recognize that you could be seriously injured. Your subordinates could be seriously injured. You could be killed. That's part of the package. And so we have to give ourselves more fully than other very admirable professions. You might be a dentist, it's admirable, but it doesn't call upon that kind of selfless sacrifice. Veterans answer a call in that regard, I think. And it, that's the, the word of the vocation, the calling. I want to tie this back to the Jesuit piece, if I might, for you. You know, people sometimes say, how did you get your calling, Father? You know, how did you know you want to be a priest, right? Well, prayer, right? God. And I would stand out on the back of my deck years after I'd gotten out of the military and say, what do you want me to do with my life? You know, what do you want me to do with my life? Came to me one day, oh, you're supposed to be a priest, you know, just sort of in the back of my head. Said, well, that's novel. You know, I hadn't really thought about that before. You would not have pegged me for a priest when I was a freshman here. And, uh, <laughs> Some say. And, um, <laughs> and uh, so then, same thing, like visiting Captain Gessner down at the detachment. I prayed about it for a while. I said, okay, I got to call the Archdiocese of Chicago where I was living and tell them. So on that one, my hand really was shaking. So I called the Archdiocese, asked for the vocation detachment, and I get the sister in charge. And I said, you know, sister, I think I'm supposed to be a priest. And I thought she's going to say, hey, come down, sign up. We've got a great parish in Hawaii. <laughs> and, uh, it actually took years till I was ultimately ordained. And then again, I never got that assignment in Hawaii. <laughs> so so um, there is a sense of calling, particularly, I think, in the military, something greater than ourselves. Values. So veterans have values. And we heard it here today. And in my day, we used to talk about the Army is a values-based, mission-oriented program. It is a values-based, mission-oriented organization, and the cadets said it, mission first, people always. We used to say missions first, soldiers always. And now, actually, interestingly, I think they've opened it up to realize that it's not just the soldiers. The leaders have to keep the civilians in your area of operations, the broader society, but individuals in mind and the mission, and we need balanced and experienced people to weigh those two things, which hopefully do not come into conflict, but sometimes, because of the nature of violence, war, uh, it's very difficult decisions have to be made there, and we need people with values. Now, those values, we know, enshrined in our Constitution, which are take, there's an oath to defend, and in our other documents, Declaration of Independence, right? So these self-evident rights, these rights by which we are endowed by our creator, inalienable rights, and we recognize, you know, so say in the Bill of Rights, and we value those for ourselves as leaders, as members of the military, as members of the society, and for others. We hope to share those globally. We, uh, we you know, freedom. Uh, right to assemble, right to the press. Those are universal human values we would like to see spread throughout our own culture and society and globally. And veterans have those values. 
I think on a day like Veterans Day, we celebrate the great qualities of our veterans. I think we also have to recognize that life is not all rainbows and butterflies, right? Let's remember veterans who sometimes are overlooked, and I think those might be the homeless. We have a huge homeless population here in Milwaukee, and we have those suffering from physical wounds. They might be in the care of the VA, they might not. Those with those invisible wounds, right? And that's very real. We're learning more and more coming off of the recent conflicts. And we know those veterans who do not fit back in so well are out there, and that's a reality. Some suffering from drug or alcohol addiction. And veterans, my friends, are not superhuman. They're actually exceptionally human, quintessentially human, and suffer with all the trials and troubles that any other person might encounter. So today I think we want not only to honor those who exhibit the exemplary traits we look for in the members of our armed forces and particularly amongst the leaders, but we want to look for those who have been pushed to the margins by their mental disease or physical disability and we do commit as a society and as an institution to caring for them. We remember those veterans today as well. Last theme is fellowship. And I talked with uh, Colonel retired Steve Ronyarsik, also a graduate of this detachment, uh, well known to some of the people here. And uh, he said this about fellowship, and this would just be the closing passage. One thing about veterans, says Colonel Steve Ronyarsik, is we all share a common path. We have the basic training experience, we have a common educational experience, it's a branch maybe in a branch officer course. We serve in the same places. And when you meet a veteran, if you're in an airport or at the counter of a coffee shop in a bar, you'll find something you have in common. Today we were talking about East Berlin, West Berlin, places we've been. And these things we can talk about as if we served together, even if it was years apart and in different places. You know, sometimes people joke around and say, we went to different high schools together. But in the Army, that's very often the case is, oh, I was in Grafenver, oh, you know, I was in Tikrit, whatever it might have been. So we share that special fellowship and bond, and it's irreplaceable. You'll find that out, especially the young people here, as you go through your career, you'll have a positive connection with people who have served. It's that special bond we talk about. Veterans have served, have kept the promises, we hope, we hope to live by our values, and we enjoy that special fellowship. So may God keep that so in all of you, and may God bless you all. Thank you.